I will uh, continue the discussion about the 105 and 218 materials. And I want to remind you that they are Fermi superconductors and they have related structure, right? So we stopped at, at the point that I was discussing that some particular crystal field symmetry and ground state may favor one state to another. So you can have a, a, a XY doublet that favors magnetism and you may have a Eisen doublet that may favor superconductivity. So just to remind you the compound, so the zero rolling O5 is the one that is the one that is unferromagnetic and can be tuned to superconductivity by illegal doping and by cobalt doping. Uh, and that's the single layer version. The bilayer version is the 0 to 1, 8. The rhodium compound is also magnetic and it can be, can be tuned to superconductivity also by illegal doping and by cobalt doping. And both of them can also be tuned to superconductivity by pressure. So that's the 115 high pressure phase diagram. You can see that you have superconductivity almost in the all doping range of the phase diagram. And that's the 2 and 8 pressure composition phase diagram. So the magnetism which is in which is in green here can also be tuned to supernutivity here, which is red. So both by tuning and by doping, you can achieve superconductivity in these materials. And at the end of my talk, uh, I discussed that there are experimental evidence that shows that the superconducting materials, they have more easy light doublets than the magnetic ones. So that's the, the neutron and X-ray absorption data that clearly show the evolution of the ground states. And uh, I remind you that I discussed that TNA can be affected by these changes too. And I, I found that comparing the evolution of the magnetic properties of these systems using gadolinium, and neodymium, and the other earths, and we found that thinale for zero can go down as the, the doublet becomes more easy -like. Okay, so going back to that point, one can uh, construct a very qualitative description for, to the properties based in some kind of a plot like that, where you have the, the energy scale of the RKQI, which we think is constant among the material. And uh, you have the color temperature that we, we at the first glance, assume that is constant, because we don't know how it evolves yet. And we, uh, and I showed you that only by changing the crystal field environment from cubic to tetragonal, in changing the anisotropy of the ground state, increasing the anisotropy being more Eisen-like, one could uh, decrease TNA. So if you have a material that's a condo lattice and you do some crystal field tuning like that, you can end up with a material that has an energy scale for TNA that's actually lower than TK. So you can go for, from, a, from a magnetic material to a non-magnetic material by frustrating the local moment orbit uh, ordering by the crystal field tuning. So we thought that this could lead to a frustrating local moment fluctuations because the energy scale of the name is lower than TK. And that, that fluctuation can be important <coughs> somehow to magnetism, to superconductivity, sorry. Because you have first rate uh, long range order, you have your local moments fluctuating, and that may be important for superconductivity. But the question here is uh, how can I ex explore how TK evolve, evolves uh, when, when I go in this direction? I don't know, right? As you heard from Peace this morning, that when you change the crystal fields, you, you also can change TK. So, how can I use? some kind of material approach, experimental material approach, to find out how TK is involved in here. So we thought to do the following. We choose the, a magnet compound, zero rolling U5, and we choose to do uh, two different kinds of doping. A London substitution at the zero site, so that's dilution, and a thin substitution at the indium site. 
So gene has one electron uh, more than angel, a B electron. So you are doing some kind of electronic tuning at the serial side when you double with tin. For a cone material, when you increase the local density of states, you tend to increase TK. On the other hand, for lanthanum, lanthanum is larger than cerium, so lanthanum acts as negative pressure. Negative pressure tends to decrease TK. And then we choose two samples that doping with lanthanum and doping with tin, we set the same tin name. Right? We uh, carefully choose the concentration of lanthanum and tin, then we set the same tin name. We did that to say, let, let's start at the same point in terms of RKQ1 interaction and crystal field, because we know that both, in both, both uh, uh, properties are connected. So choosing the same tin name, we try to be as close as possible to the same RKQI and crystal field. And then we apply pressure, because we know that zero root in U5 is a superconductor under pressure. So we did that, we applied pressure, and we found what pressure I need in the two cases to see superconductivity again, right? So we can see that we reach superconductivity for both samples, for the thin dope and for the lanthanum dope, right? But the pressure phase diagram are different for them. We can see here that the red points are from thin. They are at lower pressure than the blue points, which are the lanthanum dope. So if you put normalize the, the, the energy, the temperature scales, you can see that the superconducting dome is uh, at lower pressure for tin and higher pressure for lanthanum. So that tells us that when we increase hybridization, you bring superconductivity closer. And in, when you decrease the cone effect, you are pushing the superconductivity away although they have the same magnetic energy scale. So that tells us that uh, if you just suppress your magnetic ordering without increasing hybridization, that will not be effective for superconductivity because you are not uh, uh, hybridizing your F electrons enough with the band. So comparing these two situations, we conclude that, okay, we can have that, that tuning from the crystal field skin, and you can get to a crystal field level that's more convenient for superconductivity. But that magnetic fluctuation with that symmetry has to be taken to the Fermi circuit. So you need some kind of hybridization. So if you decrease hybridization, you push away superconductivity, if it, even though you can have this, the, the right doublet. So that's what we think is going on here. So we can try to do a different uh, approach to prove the same thing. We can choose now a doping cadmium to favor magnetism. So when, when you dope these materials with cadmium, cadmium has one less p electron. So you decrease the local density of state. So you favor RKQI respect with the cone. When you do that, you increase the nail temperature as a function of cadmium. So the four Fs are become more localized. Does cadmium act as a physical pressure at all? Is it bigger or No, it, yeah, so it does. It, uh, no, that's right. Both thin and cadmium yes. introduce a little bit of uh, distortion. Mm -hmm. But it's not the main effect. That's very small. And the, the main effect is the charge transfer and the serial <coughs> side. So NMR has seen that. Okay. Right? When you put a cadmium there, you locally create a, a bubble of antifar magnetism. So is the tuning, electronic tuning is the more important than the chemical pressure for tin and cadmium. London is just chemical pressure. Okay, <coughs> okay. so here the idea was, let's get one of these cadmium doped samples and see what's going on with the doublet. So unfortunately, we couldn't uh, found yet, couldn't find yet, the crystal field scheme. We are still trying to figure out the, the crystal field scheme. We tried to measure by neutrons, but we couldn't 
uh, result. But we did see how the magnetic structure changed. And we, find, we found that uh, the, mom, the direction of the moment of serum are affected by cadmium, which tells us that the crystal fields are being affected by cadmium. Like I said in the, the last lecture, the direction of the moment with respect to the lattice is, the, is defined by the crystal field. So we know it's changing. And we know, exploring the different compounds, that they have the tendency to go to the plane. You see, that's the direction of the moment for a cadmium dope sample. For the pure compound, the angle is about 55 degrees. And in all cadmium dope samples, they are decreasing to the plane. So you see for this sample is 21 degrees, and for that particular sample is already in the plane. And we, we also found that in, in this compound, the pressure, the pressure, if you choose the sample to apply pressure, the direction of the moment is also going to the plane. So that's a, a particular case that we can use to say the following. Now I have a system that applying pressure, I can see if I can find superconductivity with the uh, x, y, w, right? Because the moment's in the plane. And we measure resistivity and central pressure up to 35 kilowatt, and there is no superconductivity. Actually, this work was done here at CBPF. Is, is this hydrostatic pressure or uniaxial? Always hydrostatic. So what happens if you put uniaxial? Well, that may change things, but I, I haven't done it, so I don't know. But pro in principle, it may change things. But the point I want to make, I don't know, uh, uniaxial pressure can tune the crystal field scheme in a different way, it's possible. So if it goes to the C-axis, I would expect to see some superconductive divergence, but I don't know, but if it's possible. But at least for hydrostatic, I know that goes to, to the plane and there is no superconductivity. So at least for all the compounds we uh, have studied and we, we know well the crystal field scheme in this particular family, we can say that the superconducting ones are the ones that, ha that, has, that have the Eisen-like anisotropy. But again, you need Eisen-like anisotropy and a strain of hybridization enough to take this fluctuation to the first Okay, so that's the, <coughs> the main conclusion for this part. So we think that the, the, it's, a, it's a very important parameter su superconductivity, the, the symmetry of the crystal field doublet. Uh, and uh, some people have already discussed, trying to discuss this theoretically. The first uh, paper I knew was, was actually from Japan, from Takashi Hota, that he wrote a paper about power to control superconductivity, considering both the orbital fluctuation and the spin fluctuation. And that's two competing fluctuations taking account exactly the, the ground state of the doublet, because uh, the coefficients of the doublet defines the orbital and the spin contribution. So he, he showed that changing this value here, which is related to the alpha and beta of the ground state, which we see change experimentally, you can go from antiferromagnetism to superconductivity. And also, Rebecca Flint and Pierce, they have considered the effect of the, the crystal field scheme in the cone interaction, and they also find ways to have a, a multi-channel-like pairing that take into account the crystal field scheme. Okay, so in terms of design materials, we start to think about, about all the side symmetry importance to look for a new structures. So if I consider that I have a good chance to find a firm superconductor when I have an Eisen-like doublet, I need to start looking for possible low symmetry structure that I can place here on there and check if they are Eisen or not and then looking for new materials. is a very easy route to follow, right? So we start doing that and uh, at the point when we uh, start to think about this, we always try to relate it, the 115s and 218s to the cuprates. At that time, uh, the, the iron nictites, they were not discovered yet, so we didn't have that bridge. But at the moment that we uh, 
we start to study also the other nictites, they were discovered, we could see maybe a more easy route between all this family. Because we know that there are heavy ferro superconductors also in the 1 to 2 family, like zero power to cylinder 2. So that motivates us to think about some relationship between all these structures. So then, look into the properties of the iron nictites. We know that they can have superconductivity induced by doping, like the potassium doping I'm showing there, that you have seen already. And they can be tuned to superconductivity by pressure. Right? So for, for calcium, for barium, for strong, so all of them we can apply pressure and they have superconductivity. In that sense, they are more, more similar to the heavy ferrous, right? Because cuprate, you cannot tune it to superconducting state by pressure. But here you can, just like in the, in the heavy ferrous compounds I showed you. So that motivates us to think about what is the role of doping in pressure in the neat types. There is something related to the structure, like we try to see, try to find in the, in the heavy ferrous. So, in order to study this particular problem, we needed to have our own samples. So we start from the beginning to, to grow nictites and campinas, right? So it turns out that both this both family they are grown from flux method. So just two transparency about flux growth. So in flux growth, you can grow single crystals from using low melting solvent. Right? So you choose a metal that has a low melting point, and that metal will uh, be your flux during the growth. So it could be uh, the medium to nucleate the crystal, to work as a solvent, and to get the atoms to nucleate some place under the growth. So it's a very simple hardware. You need to use inert atmosphere, otherwise we will oxidize your metals. It could be low temperature, it could be very fast, depending on the treatment. Uh, and uh, yeah, very frequently, you can get very nice self-cleaning and well-faced morphologies, very frequently. So actually, what you do, you have your elements, you seal, you put inside a crucible, and you have a quartz tool here, and you seal inside a quartz tube. Your elements, you have a certain stoichiometry, and you have your flux that can be part of the, the material also. So that's self flux, or can be a different one. And then you go to a temperature that not necessarily your atoms are melted, but your flux is melted. And then you choose the right concentration and temperature profile to provide the nucleation of the, the phase you are looking for. And then you cool very slowly and stop in a, a certain temperature that you may, you already have your phase, but you can uh, expel the flux. You can use a centrifuge and get your flux out and keep the crystals. So here are some pictures. So that's a piece of cereal, that's cobalt uh, powder, that's a piece of indium. So all of this is inside the crystal here. You have quartz two at the bottom, quartz two at the top of the crucible, and they are sealed inside the quartz two. So one can take from the oven at a certain temperature, put in a centrifuge. That's a centrifuge and not a toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can do the spinning. You can see the engine here that goes through the, the quartz two, and you break the crucible, and you have the crystals there. That's a couple slides ago you had a couple slides ago you had that diagram that told you like what and everything. Did they map those out just based on which one? Top. Go back. This one? Forward. Forward. That. So Oh, that's just for a book, right? What well so but how did they map? All of the, well, they 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 measure that temperature by, for instance, um, differential uh, calorimetry, differential calorimetry to see to get the, the right enthalpy of formation for all the phases. So we can do that, and we can uh, map 
the temperature, the amount of injured and, and, and plutonium that you are using here is plutonium, right? So you can do the mapping, determine this temperature by a, a, a differential calorimetry, and mapping the stoichiometry with the temperature for each phase, experimentally. Okay, but that so that, that's the entropy of formation of each phase that you can measure directly. Okay, but that requires a lot of work, right? That's what yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, when you look to this phase, that binary phase diagrams in the book, you can see many references, like 10 or 12 or more, that many works have map different parts. They put it all together and they make these huge books of binary phase diagrams. Okay. And the, when you have a binary, I mean, along of the years, they have mapped many phase diagrams like that, right? But then you go to ternaries or quaternaries, that become even more complicated. So you, you have some, but not as many as the binary. And so there's no way to predict anything, right? It's just completely it's very difficult. Okay. What, what we do usually, we get the binaries, right? <laughs> we have a ternary, so we get the binaries between the, them and try to figure out what's going to happen with the ternary and quaternary. So that's a lot of work for the sample grower. Right, so that's why I'm just trying to figure out how people make samples that haven't been made before. Well, we, we should use something that we know. We know this, and you look at that, and try to guess things. Right, Based, based, yeah. based in some criteria, of course. Right. So assume that, okay, I want to grow, let us assume I want to grow a phase that has a lot of plutonium, has more plutonium than indium, but I want to add cobalt. And then I, I look at, at the cobalt indium diagram and plutonium cobalt diagram. And then I look to the temperatures <laughs> and I look to the ratios. And then I say, oh, well, okay, so I need like three plutonium for indium and how, how much cobalt to plutonium. And how about the temperatures? So you, you try to construct that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. That sounds very right? tedious. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, that's the same thing for the for the nictites. So here I'm showing iron, cobalt, arsenic, and indium. We prefer to use indium flux for these samples. We tried cell flux, we tried tin flux, and we believe indium flux is better. So that's one example for a particular sample that we try to make and I think it's, it's good, it's a, a good quality. So we're showing here a crystal for cobalt doping and that's how we prepare our, our axonite samples. Okay, so here's some comparison. So that's the pure compound. So we have indium flux is the red, thin flux is the white triangles. And that's polycrystal for literature, that's self flux for literature. So you can see that we have the transition at the right place, and we have a large triple R than the, the indium. And I'll, you can see that we start at higher resistivity, but we go below, so we have a, a smaller uh, resist, uh, residual resistivity. Here's the derivative for the transition. But comparing the resistivity is complicated. We think it's, it's comparable or better than self flux, but it's complicated because resistivity you have a sample to sample variation of it. So we need to trust some more microscopic probe, and we use NMR. So that's our Senec NMR at high temperature. And you can see that we have a very sharp line. According to our NMR specialist, it's the sharpest line in literature for this compound. And we, when you compare with tin, tin, everybody knows that you can, you can have tin inclusion. You can easily see by NMR, you see here that you have different shoulders corresponding to different amount of tin that was incorporated into the sample. And here the X-ray as a function of temperature, just showing the, the charter or the run transition. So we decide to use our Indian growth sample. So here we map the phase diagram for cobalt doping just to prove that they have the same general future because that was published already for the other samples. And we also can make cobalt 
uh, copper, ruthenium, nickel, all well, of them, all doping from indium. You can see here all the transitions. And in fact, for, for most of them, we get a little bit higher TC, close to near your PDS samples. You can see the red points there, they are our samples. So except for ruthenium, the ones we tried, we get a little bit higher TC than the published. Okay, so that, from that we decide to see if you can get some inform, important information really to the physics of the problem. And trying to compare our results to the heavy fermions. So first, of course, we try to look at the CO array. And probably you know that there is no clear relationship between CO array and TC for the nick types. You cannot <coughs> find this very easily. It's, it's, it's not systematic. But as you learned from the 111 case, from the oxides, there are some uh, correlation with the local site symmetry of iron. So if you look into the tetrahedral there, there may be some relation between the C and the tetrahedral angle. So we try to look for something similar in our samples. We say, let's look to the local structure of iron. Right? So we did that by x ups Extend X ray absorption, Fourier X spectroscopy in our synchrotron. So that work was led by Eduardo Granat, which is collaborator in the same group. And we did that as a function of pressure. And we chose two different doping. What they say, electron doping and hole doping. So you have cobalt and potassium, right? So we found that when you apply pressure, you can see here that you have a, a decrease of the distance of the arsenic iron bound. So clearly we have a decrease of use of pressure. Okay, that's not surprised, right? But when you dope with cobalt and potassium, you also have the same contraction despite what happened with the lattice parameters. So the Three different kinds of tuning parameters here, the pressure, the cobalt doping, and the potassium doping, they have the same contraction of the iron arsenic angle. That suggests that in the three case, you have a similar tuning parameter structurally. Then we see, okay, but let's, let's see what's going on regarding the doping of the sample. So we got the, the cobalt doping, and we try to map what's happening at the iron site regarding to doping, regarding to charge transfer. In order to do that, we measure uh, the X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy at the iron edge. So we can map how the charge is being transferred for, for cobalt to the iron orbitals as a function of doping. So we have done that, and we can see uh, many features at, the, at this edge related to the hybridization of the, the exciting states to the deep bands of iron. So we, one can map all features as a function of X and see if they have the expected shift if you have a transfer for cobalt to the iron side. And we didn't see any feature associated with cobalt doping, any shift of the edge for any of the features of the spectrum as a function of dope. And that, that result is actually provides experimental support to an initial calculation from Sabatis group that they claim that the electron of cobalt is not being transferred to the iron orbitals. There are some places else. They could be localized, but they are not being transferred to the D orbitals of iron. So that's the result from this technique, which think, we think is very important. For us, that's not real doping, because when you do that in the cooperates, you can see a shift when you do that at the right edge. So that seems to us that you have some kind of tuning of the, that could be structured in our opinion, that may change the firm surface but not a real doping in the sense that the electron for cobalt is going to the iron orbitals. Okay, so how can we track then? How can we study what's going on with the 3D bands of iron 
as we make any sort of tunings. So to do that, we use uh, a spring probe that's not very common these days, but we have in our laboratory and it's very useful in this regard. So we are going to use uh, electron spin resonance to study this evolution. And we are going to do uh, electron spin resonance at the rotten spin and at the manganese and copper spin in the plane. So we, can, we have a site-specific ESR. So we can look at the rotten and we can look at the manganese in our setting. Before I go on, I need to acknowledge that this work here was done by Eduardo Bittar, which is in the audience somewhere. So we're there. So any further questions, please direct to him. <laughs> and now, actually, we're going to talk about Priscilla's work in ESR. So that's her PhD thesis. Any further questions, please direct to her. <laughs> OK. So first of all, I will just say a few words about ESR. So ESR is actually a very old technique. So the original papers are from 1945, from uh, And the reason the energy scale for the ESR, uh, they are related to electronic enzyme effect. So they are the range of the microwave energy, right? Which is a little bit higher frequency than the NMR, which is the radio wave. <coughs> so you know, what you do, you use a, a cavity, a microwave cavity, when you have a, a microwave mold inside. So that's a, a basic uh, ESR spectrometer. You have a, a microwave generator that goes to the cavity for two different ways. So first, one way, it goes to a, a frequency uh, device that control the frequency and go to a, a diode, a detector diode. The other way goes to the cavity and come back, they are compared. So if I have an absorption in the cavity, my crystal detector will detect that difference between the microwave that goes and the microwave that comes back. So the basic physics is just uh, when we have a, a spin and a half, for instance, and we apply a magnetic field, we know that we're going to have the zen splitting of these two levels, and we are uh, we are having microwave uh, at a fixed frequency in, uh, over the sample. So when the energy of the microwave is equal to the energy of the splitting, you have an absorption, and you can detect that absorption. In order to do that, you need to have the field of the microwave, per, the magnetic field of the microwave perpendicular to the field of the static uh, field of the elect electromagnet. So very in the field, you have an absorption peak like that. But that's not very useful to detect. So you need to amplify that signal. In order to amplify that signal, you use a modulation coils that produce uh, an additional magnet field in the same direction of the static field. So when you modulate the, your absorption signal, you can amplify and detect uh, using a locking amplifier, because you only amplify the response in phase at the same frequency of your modulation. So that then finds orders of magnitude your signal. Why don't you use spin echo type methods? That you use because that's power. continuous wave, right? No, I, I understand this. I understand. I understand it's continuous wave absorption. Would right. you get, would in principle it be possible to do spin echo type measurements and improve the resolution and also, also measure T2? So. Yeah, well, it's possible. We have, uh, you have uh, pulsed ESR that uses spin echo. Yes. So they are useless for this kind of material because T2 is extremely fast. Mm -hmm. So spin echo and uh, pulsed ESR are usually used for very light uh, materials, organics, oh. and you have a very, very narrow lines. Nice. And then you can use that and improve. But in, for these materials, it would be useful. I have never seen the work for those okay. kind of materials. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. So actually, I tried by myself for different materials, uh, exploring the, the effect of T2, because I want to separate T1 from T2 from a particular material. And I tried very hard to use spin echo in a pulse DSR in some carlos, but we cannot even see the line. 
very difficult to see heavier atoms or positive yes. So uh, those are the pictures for our triple mixing computers. We have two, that's the old one, the one that I did my PhD work, and that's the new one where Priscilla does her PhD work. You <laughs> see that her life is much easier. Right? See here, I still, I use the, the paper spectrum. You see, so I need to measure the line with the G with the ruler. See, that's complicated. Okay. Uh, so we have these four bands that goes to 34.4 gigahertz. That's a field for G equal to 12,000 gauss. But uh, Brooker has even uh, higher frequency spectrometer that can go to 90 gigahertz. And in Tallahassee, they can go even higher. They can go to 300 gigahertz. OK. Uh, so what can we learn from ESR? How can we use? this technique to explore the 3D bands of nictites. Okay, so like I said, it's just a Zim effect and an absorption between the two spin levels. So what parameters we, we are looking at? We're looking at the position of the line, that's the field for resonance, that gives you the G value or the internal field that we have there. So that can tell you valence of the ions, what kind of doublet, crystal field doublet we have, Right? So that gives you information about what kind of spin we have there. Beside that, we have the line width. The line width can give information about relaxation, how fast that spin relaxes to the lattice or to next neighbor, right? Relaxation process. But the problem here is that as is, this is a continuous wave, continuous wave experiment, you also have an homogeneity. So if you have distribution of G values, distribution of crystal fields, that will give you a broad line. So you cannot separate what is relaxation from what is in homogeneity. T1 and T2, we cannot separate. That was the previous question. And the intensity of this line is proportional to the suitability, right? So if you have a Curie, uh, a localized spin, the intensity should grow uh, in a Curie-like manner. If you have a conduction electron resonance, it should be constant. So it should follow the, the, the suitability. Also, the line shape gives you some information because the line shape is affected by the skin depth of the microwave and also by the diffusion of the electrons if you have a metal. So, in metal, we usually have an, an, an isotropic line like this one, which we call Dysonian. When you go to insulator, you have an isotropic line that we call Lorentzian. So, this height here is equal to this in a Lorentzian, and the, the height A is larger than the B. In okay, remember the crystal fields? We can also see very well the crystal fields by ESR in two different ways. One can determine very well the crystal field doublet, much better than any neutron experiments. They can measure very well the energy, but we can tell the G value, the wave function of the ground state, like with four digit, with a very high precision if the line is narrow. So they need to make a model, right, to extract crystal fields, the ones that are neutrons. I don't know if you work with crystal fields, no? Okay, but you can get that directly from the last of the but we need to do models, fittings to, to the data, because you measure the energy, and you need to do the data from, to get intensities and get the wave functions. Here we can measure the ground state very precise, very accurately. But the interesting thing in crystal fields in ESR is when you have like the gadolini that I used to produce regard crystal fields, actually they have crystal fields, but it's a second order effect. So they have the same size of the Zeeman energy. So we can see them directly in your spectrum. So you can measure something like this. Right? That's a very small crystal field splitting, like one Kelvin, something like that. But that's enough to uh, split your your J equals seven half, and you can see all the transition between the level in your spectrum. So you can see the, the fine structure of the gadolinium, which is crystal field second order effect. Also for a rocket, one can see that because a rocket two plus is like a gadolinium, has equal L equals zero. So we can see when you have it in an insulator, you can see the splitting of the lines, and the rocket has also. Uh, uh, hyperfine lines because it has a nuclear spin. 
So you can see very complicated spectrum like that that you can map all the lines and get the parameters from the crystal field and parameter from the hyperfine coupling with the nuclei. So it's a very powerful uh, technique when you can see all the, the lines. <coughs> okay, so we're going to use that to try to study the link types and we need to care about what kind of relaxation process we can have in this method. So we need a localized spin. Do we have a localized spin in nick tides? No, as far as I know. So if I put barium, iron, two, arsen two in my spectrometer, I don't see any. Right? How about European iron tubes, arsenic tube? Sounds cool, right? European has a big moment there, right? So I should see the European resonance, right? How about copper? No? I'm sorry. Is that the moment? Yeah. We can see copper in sun. Manganese. Nickel? <laughs> I'm sorry, no. It's in there. Cobalt? No. So you see, you have some formation already from ESI, right? We could see copper, we could see manganese. We couldn't see nickel, we couldn't see cobalt. Can we say something about the TC of this kind of doping now? Which one do you expect to have a higher TC when we dope? If I dope with the local moment, what can happen? What's this? <laughs> okay, so it makes sense that copper has lower TC then, right? Than nickel or than copper? Than the cobalt, I'm sorry. And manganese has no TC at all, right? Manganese doping, as far as I know. Yet. Yes. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay, going back, if I get a localized spin there, <coughs> and I have a resonance of that spin, that spin will transfer energy, the, the resonant energy, to the lattice or to the neighbor that will have some sort of relaxation process. So it can transfer to the conduction band, and the conduction band can transfer to the lattice. That's exactly T1, right? But it can transfer to the conduction electrons, and then back to the spin, to the localized spin. So it can stay there. So when this happens, we call this a botnet effect. That means that the energy goes from the local moment to the conduction band, back and forth. But we don't have that here, and I show you why, because this, when you dilute your sample, the relaxation should increase because you're changing the concentration of the catalyzed <laughs> spin. And we don't see that, so we can disregard both mechanisms. Other possibility is to uh, have the energy going straight to the lattice. So that involves the spin orta coupling of your localized spin to direct to the lattice. In our case, we're going to use europium, which is L equals zero. So that's very small. And also copper and manganese. Both of them, when they are two plus, they have quantum of angular momentum. They have G very close to two. So we can disregard it. So our mechanism will be two conduction electrons. So we are mapping the relaxation of the conduction band by SR. So the most simple uh, scenario is that the, the relaxation rate to the conductor electron will be a Coringa mechanism, which is a linear increase with temperature. That's the mechanism that in, involves the transfer between the localized spin to conductor electron to the lattice is proportional to temperature, and is proportional to the density of states times the exchange squared. This exchange is between the local moment spin and the conduction band, JFS. The same one that goes in the RKQI, the same one that goes at the quantum. So it appears here. Okay, so besides having a relaxation um, 
rate involving a conduction electron. The conduction electron can have a power of set B, right? They can have a power of set B if they can create internal field. Is that right? So say they can create internal field, they can create the shift of the resonance, which is the G shift, which is also proportional to the power of stability, which is proportional to the days of states and to the G. So in a very simple scenario, you can make an experimental relation between the, the G shift and the Coringa. You see you have the same structure here, so the Coringa is proportional to the G squared. So you can measure your G shift and try to relate it to the Coringa rate. Okay. <coughs> so what, what system do we choose? We choose to do the Europium ESR and manganese copper ESR. Okay, so that's the samples for the bioreopium family. So we went all the way to the pure rhodium to the pure band. So here's just the phase diagram of the basic properties. So we can see that we have a decreased of the SDW. Europium has a, a ultramagnet ordering that think that is suppressed because you are dilute. So the basic properties of the materials. You can see the stability here. You can see at that specific heat, you can see the TSDW here for pure rhodium. It goes down with barium. That's the TNA of the rhodium that goes down. Uh, you can see that in stability too, going down here. That's the TSDW that you can only see at the barium limit, the, the, the barium reach limit, because of you have less rhodium contribution. You can see the high temperature uh, evolution of the, the stability, which includes the, the spin of the rhodium as you go to the rhodium reach. And that's the shift of the transition measured by resistivity. So let's go to ESR. So we've got the same samples that we do ESR. So that's the European line for different concentrations. At the European reach limit, we see Coringa. So that's the linear decrease of the line width. I can only do this at high temperature in the power negative phase. Why? Because if I go below just the W, you're going to have a very broad line because of the distribution of the internal field in the order state. So we can map the Coringa at high temperature. We, that's the only we can do. So we see that when you go to the barium uh, uh, reach limit, this Coringa uh, contribution is decreasing. So the slope of that linear behavior is decreasing. And at very dilute regime, we don't have Coringa at all. So the Coringa contribution just disappeared, which is strange, but it's a still a semi map. And we don't see, as a function of temperature, and neither as a function of concentration, any G shift. So we don't see the evolution of the internal field. You, you could imagine that the Coringa disappear because we are losing conduction electrons, the G value should go to an insulator value. But it doesn't go. So we don't have any shift of G. So our, our model to describe the problem it should be uh, should be taken into consideration different aspects. So in a more complicated scenario, the exchange interaction that goes into the G shift is not the same that goes in the Coringa rate. Also, you can have a, a stoner enhancement of the power stability. So when you have that, you can have an alpha parameter here in the G sheet and a K alpha parameter in the Coringa. So that makes things different there too. <coughs> OK, in order to test this, this uh, hypothesis, we use that formula. OK, please. Yeah, I will just, uh, yeah, that's my, my <coughs> next slide. Okay, so that's what happened here. So first we do the following. We use the delta G experimentally, replace in the formula that I showed here to test what's going on. Let's go back here. In the very simple scenario, I can relate to the Coringa with the G, delta G, right? Coringa will be proportional to delta G. Delta G squared. So 
I get the delta z experimentally and I can calculate the Carina, the expected Carina. It's much larger than the experimental man for all compounds. So that means that the J that goes in the Coringa should be smaller than the J that goes in the G sheet. And that's it's called Q dependent of exchange. That's a known effect in ESR. And that's why when you have the G sheet, you must have your conduction letter spin. Uh, always creating an internal field at the European side. So you cannot have a spin flip. They need to keep the polarization. So they need to come in and go out in the same K. You cannot have moment transfer during the interaction to produce G sheet. For the Moringa, 